The internet has placed the entire world's knowledge at our fingertips. We now each walk around with more information in our front pockets than most people even 50 years ago would have had access to in their entire lives. And this is often extremely liberating. But passing the useful and the verifiable information from that which is more questionable can sometimes prove a little trickier. Nowhere is this more true than in regards to health. With conventional healthcare systems either coming under strain due to lack of funding or just being outright expensive to engage with, more and more of us are turning to the internet for reassurance or remedy. In today's episode of Induction, I explore both sides of this phenomenon in a chat with YouTuber and cardiologist Rohan Francis. Well, Rohan, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for giving aside some time of your evening and you've had a really busy day. Uh, to to join me and chat with me. No, and thanks for the invite. Nice to be here. How 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 are you? Are things things going well today? Oh, very nice. Yes, I've I've just um, after work been out in the garden, putting planting some new seeds and repotting some little seedlings and everything. Just a a bit of um, middle age creeping in there. A bit of bit bit, bit of springtime though. It has very it does very much feel like it's. I'm I'm a. I, I'm a runner. I run quite a lot. And there's something really nice about being able to go out in the evening and it's still light. And I'm not just oh, yeah. traipsing around some horrible roads in the dark with a head torch on. Uh, I can actually sort of in enjoy the world. Um, but can I ask you to, for anyone who is listening or watching, uh, depending on how people are uh, engaging with this. Uh, can I ask you to introduce yourself and t tell us a little bit about your, yourself? I'm sure you will introduce yourself much better than I will introduce you for you. For you. Sure, yeah. Uh, my name is Rohan. I am a consultant interventional cardiologist, which is a bit of a mouthful, but it basically means I specialize in um, the heart, but specifically in sort of heart attacks and things like that. But general, uh, all, all kind of aspects of cardiology as well. I'm based out in Essex. I've recently left London and never looked back. I love London very much, but um, I'm delighted to have left and uh, I'm enjoying life much more. And my, you know, side thing um, and how we know each other is via my YouTube channel, which is where I discuss sort of um, medical themed topics, but not so much explainers about medical problems necessarily, but more maybe policy, ethics, things like that, sort of meta um, themes around medicine, a um, bit of philosophy and stuff like that. And I think that's a, an overlap for, for you and I. Mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, the, the, those are the those are the kind of two main um, things that take up most of my time alongside, obviously, family. I was going to say that sounds like en enough <laughs> already, and then and then throw in having having a having a family to spend time with as well, because uh, you are one of I think you're probably the most qualified person we have have had on the show so far. I don't know I don't know how you can stack qualifications up against each other, <laughs> but um. Well. <laughs> That's uh, well. That's an honour. Thanks. Certainly, the only person who could deal with, deal with a heart attack uh, 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 together. But um, but yeah, I think what what's always really interesting in in your channel is how you do uh, combine that kind of medical knowledge of how stuff works inside of our bodies, but also do the uh, ways in which it the, the social aspect of all of that as well, uh, which must have be which I guess is something we've all been much more aware of since the pandemic a little bit in terms of before that public health probably wasn't a really cool topic that everyone wanted to talk about. But now suddenly everyone has a little bit of an opinion about good or bad uh, in terms of, yeah, how do we deal with big health problems? Um, and I guess an interest in that is something and an upswing in people talking about some of that aspect of stuff must have really changed the the content that you're making when you're making YouTube videos because because of that uprise in, in, in interest in how do we think about, you know, not trying to get diseased. Yeah, I think, you know, the pandemic was um, bad for the world, but uh, good for my YouTube channel. <laughs> so, you know. 50-50. But um, uh, yes, it definitely brought a lot more attention 
Um, and that was a little disconcerting, you know, because then I, I suddenly felt more responsibility from a channel where I just used to kind of shit post and, and um, uh, sort of talk nonsense a lot of the time. I really thought, actually, you know, I potentially could could do something really useful here and try and explain some of the um, uh, the concepts that we've all had to, to learn about in the last three years. And um, I mean, I think it would be fair to say that I, I quickly got quite bored of covering COVID, actually. I think mm. I think we all did. We I think we all got quite bored of it. So I tried to, you know, be less of a, a news, you know, update COVID news kind of stuff, because you can get that anywhere, but more trying to analyze some of the um, the data that was coming out, trying to sort of find a bit of middle ground between different camps that seem to have gone off to two extremes. Um, so it, yeah, it's been a very uh, bizarre time um, because initially I thought, well, this isn't really my field. Infectious disease, public health um, is is something is not my background. Mm. But then it you know it cl quickly became something so pervasive. So I didn't want to portray myself as the expert, but maybe you know just somebody with medical training and and particularly sort of an interest in academia and critical appraisal of, of trials to, to maybe bring that kind of, um, um, you know, ability to, to, to the, to the channel and try and explain some of those things. And that's a really, that's a really interesting approach actually, in terms of the fact that I think one of the dangers of a lot of social media, whether it's YouTube or, or Twitter or TikTok or um, whatever <laughs> other platform is that I guess you're coming to it from a point of view where, there's a real sense of professional standards in terms of both both really official stuff in terms of I, I don't know exactly what it is, but you know there is specific stuff that you can and can't do in to, and you know in order to remain a practicing <laughs> doctor. Uh, but also the the cultural stuff of that being something that you think of that you go oh maybe I shouldn't talk about COVID because it's slightly over there in terms of my real expertise and. Um, Whereas when you are talking about uh, people who are selling some slightly fishier medical advice, often it's people that are actually quite happy to extrapolate their knowledge from one thing to another thing and aren't so bothered by, or oh, am I the right person to be speaking on this uh, topic? I know you've talked a lot about doctors who, who do that sometimes. Yeah, I mean, I think, there are two kinds of people that fall into th that camp, and I think they are fairly different. One is maybe the the classic Dunning Kruger sort of people who believe they genuinely do understand all these concepts without having that sort of um, you know sometimes a bit of an imposter syndrome is quite a healthy thing you know if 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 it keeps you in check, um, and that's dangerous in itself when people don't understand the 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 limits of their expertise. But I think then there is another category um, on social media in particular of people who are just charlatans, you know, that they are quite willing to um, give the impression that they're an expert when they they aren't. And I think that's a slightly different phenomenon that they are, you know, deliberately portraying themselves as something that they aren't. Yeah, yeah. The, the split between who is maliciously dressing up in in the costume of someone who who knows slightly more um i i often find that with my videos i have just enough time to research stuff that i go just to the whatever the curve is just after the peak of the hill on the dunning kruger uh trajectory or whatever you would call it uh where i've learned just enough to go oh I don't know anything about this and the video goes out in a week <laughs> so I've got to, <laughs> where I just get the crippling doubt and then I'm like oh okay well this hopefully is something yeah well I think it's a, that's that's healthy I think to to not lose that uh, I you know I feel the same way that uh, when I've made a video and I think I think our frequency of video publishing although i think you've increased a little bit recently haven't you um but uh previously it was comparable <laughs> like yeah. every few months and um then so a lot of work goes into a video and then i'll suddenly feel oh god there's there's going to be some professor of this exact yeah. thing who's just going to look at this and go oh what a complete clown is he what's he talking about 
uh, yeah, no, I, I, I definitely, definitely get that. I mean, YouTube comments are always really interesting in that the first I find day, two days, maybe up to a week, because it's all the people that watch everything that I put out. It's just <clears throat> positive praise. And then gradually the video gets out to more and more people. And that's the bit where you start to uh, get the the slightly less uh, flowery phrased comments, even if they are, even if there's critical ones before that, then maybe a little bit more couched. Um, but that... that's why I stop reading comments after 24 hours. You're... And sometimes even less, I think. <laughs> I don't know if I uh, should be saying that publicly, but um, I... You know, every now and again, I'll I'll, I'll have a, a look in, but I really, I, I, I perhaps I'm saying too much here, but um, <laughs> I, I, I think, you know, there, there's a sweet spot when you've got a channel when the comments actually are really useful mm. and, um, and nice. But I think once you pass a certain point, a lot of the time, and perhaps it's the kind of topics that I, I cover sometimes that attracts um you know a certain kind of commenter but after uh, a certain point i just decided look this is this is not really a good return on on the investment of my time here to, to read some of these comments and there's always way, other ways to get in touch with me so it's not like i i don't mm. want to hear from anybody but mm. i think that's um you know uh it's a mixed bag isn't it youtube comments i was gonna say actually because the the topics that you cover are ones that people feel really passionate about and maybe that's true for lots of topics but i think in particular healthcare i mean i guess obviously people feel really strongly about that because people like their bodies to function well generally um and to feel like they've got agency in terms of allowing that to happen um have you so and, and a lot of the the things that you tackle on your channel have often been questionable i would say uh medical therapies is that a correct way to sort of describe some of them yeah yeah exactly i think that it, there's there's a there's a spectrum isn't there from the the real kind of out there stuff that's just clear quackery and and you know frankly harmful or exploitative um through a lot of things where there's a bit of a gray zone so mm. i i find that gray zone the kind of interesting part because i think the general audience I'm targeting, it, um, I think they're quite smart. So I don't feel like me making a debunking video of something that's completely nonsensical is necessarily needed. And I think there are other people doing it much better than I ever would. Um, but I try and maybe um, tackle some of the things which maybe aren't so apparent that they are ineffective or... Uh, and, and I'm not just referring to questionable sort of therapies that people would label as alternative, you know, things that are accepted conventional um, medical practices, which maybe are not based in as much evidence as a lot of people think. So, I, yeah, I, I think that's the really interesting part where you're in that gray zone between what is what is alternative and what is real. Well, I've, I've, that's a Freudian slip there, isn't it? But uh, <laughs> it's, um, you know. You know what I'm trying to say here. <laughs> and I think I think one thing you do really well is that you don't just do the... So I was re-watching your video about Wim Hof, who I didn't know a huge amount uh, about previously, uh, but I, I know some people that do sea swimming. And they and for a while back, I, f I feel like maybe a year ago, was the, the real Wim Hof, uh, mm. the, the summer of Wim Ice Hof. Ice bath, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and... And and so I sort of I was aware that he existed. But I think what you do really well is is not just to go, okay, this is the thing that doesn't work or the thing that's being um and maybe not even misrepresented sometimes, the thing that is, you know, someone is misconstru misconstruing and then and then reflecting back at an audience, is that you do explain what does work and what is going on in a way that as someone who's not sciencey at all or not uh, medicine y at all, um I come away knowing a huge amount of uh, of stuff about how the body works and the and particularly the you know the heart and stuff. Well, if I can trick people into learning a bit of medicine, then that that's always good. I think I the can, uh, I, I, slip it in with some jokes. I think the video of yours I've learned the most about most from was this is probably what you were describing as your sort of earlier shit poster days, 
uh, was one where you play, I think it's an iPhone game or an iPad yeah, game, yeah. where you're, yeah. where, where, wherein you take on the role of a cardiologist. And for some reason, there was the pitch of that video really got me. Oh, nice. Okay. I don't know why, because I'm, I'm not particularly seeking out heart surgery videos, but there was something <laughs> about an act, uh, it was just one of those where there's something about an actual cardiologist playing, a, a, was it a sort of free to play? Yeah, I mean, um, it, it's there are quite a few medically themed games out there, and a lot of the other kind of medics on on YouTube have done little playthroughs, but they're all kind of um, d- aimed for the general audience. They're kind of a bit silly and a bit wacky, but this one is like super niche, aimed at interventional cardiologists, not even a general cardiologist, <laughs> my specific subgroup. And I was like, wow, there's a game just for this. So I thought I, I had to make a video. And um, and it was just, it was kind of hilariously nerdy the way they'd made tried to make my very mundane job into some kind of video game with explosions and things. I know, I know, I forgot when the explosions actually, it was particularly good, uh, which presumably does not happen in real life when you successfully sadly sadly not no fireworks no neon electricity on the screen it's very I, know, dull. I know so much more about stents than i did previously uh i'm everything. sorry i'm sorry about and, that <laughs> uh but uh but yeah so so has i suppose has the the pandemic let or it have you seen i guess from from your because you you sort of keep an eye on uh, a lot of these a lot of these things has there been a bit of an upswing in that kind of desire for or, or at least the promotion of slightly more alternative um therapies or uh, whatever particular label we're giving to them because because I, I definitely feel like i've started to hear a lot more about uh w- whether it's vitamin d or whether it's either i can't even pronounce it ivermectin yeah ivermectin or um or whether it's even even whether it's fern cotton's crystals or um oh really is she into crystals i think oh no i think i think it's <laughs> uh, it was fern, i think it was her sister set up a company uh for which uh the cons- the the moon was listed on their um their list of staff as uh, a consultant which was uh which was the moon the, mo- right. the moon uh it was one okay. that, where it was just like a list of everyone's jobs An, on a monthly rolling contract presumably uh uh but um but yeah has that has that been an increase or has it just been me noticing it that's i think that's a really good question i i mean clearly there has always been a a huge appetite and uh market for alternative medicine so what, what you know what do we mean by alternative medicine and um I think it's it's just we'll take it as a, a literal translation. It is some delivery of healthcare, mm. or you know, a health intervention that is pitched as an alternative to what we can call conventional medicine. Conventional medicine is you know things you would receive at your doctor um, uh, in in a sort of evidence based framework. Um, with medications that have passed certain criteria and regulatory bodies have okayed. Um, and um, during the pandemic, I think it's been a, it's been an unusual phenomenon because some of the things you mentioned just now as what we regard as not accepted by conventional medicine, as in not proven, the mm-hmm. ivermectin, the vitamin D supplementation, uh, hydroxychloroquine these are medical interventions they're all actual pharmaceutical products so you can't say that th- this is alternative medicine as in it's a uh, crystals or anything so we've seen a slightly different manifestation i think we've seen people um having the same mentality of wanting a- an alternative to conventional medicine but it's manifested in a different way. And I think the mindset is the same. I think that what the products they're promoting may be slightly different now, and they have taken on maybe more of a pseudoscientific um, Mm. image because they're talking about these actual pharmaceuticals or molecules. And, and, you know, I think there's an interesting gendered aspect to this as well, which maybe we can talk about too. Mm. But um, 
I think the reason is, is that the, the mentality underlying both of those things is people want an alternative to what they feel is a system that is not not delivering what they want. And so if we, you know, rewind to before the pandemic, um, obviously one of the big examples of this is, is Gwyneth Paltrow's Goop, which produces, you know, all kinds of different things, products. Some of them are harmless. Uh, some of them are just kind of, you know, nice things that are, are quite enjoyable. Um, and you, you would find in any kind of spa or something like that. And others which make completely unproven claims and could potentially be quite dangerous. Mm. Um, and that was already, uh, I, I don't want to get the figures wrong here, but I think the wellness industry, I think I read something that was valued at over a trillion dollars, um, you know, and that's from a couple of years ago. So, yeah. you know, I don't know if that's necessarily, uh, I mean, it won't have got any smaller um, because people already felt something was putting them off about conventional medicine or Western yeah. medicine, should we say. Um, and I think the pandemic has put a new spin on this because a lot of people have felt that, um, you know, a lot of the people promoting these alternative therapies um, are the same people who feel like there is some kind of agenda that, you know, mm -hmm. that you are, don't accept the narrative and th this, there is a, a, a conspiracy that, and all this, you know, money in from, Bill Gates and all, all this kind of stuff that is that is driving. Say, I mean, obviously, you know, vaccines is is the big, mm. the big uh, flashpoint for all of this. But I think because of the pandemic, people who are geared in that kind of who are mentally geared in that kind of way um, have seen a very aggressive side to what they and they're attributing that to, to medicine. They're saying that you know these doctors in their ivory towers are trying to tell us what to do and they're trying to force this vaccine on us. So I think it has galvanized a lot of that opposition to conventional mm -hmm. medicine. And, and I think, I don't know if there's been a, an increase in alternative kind of medicine. Um, but I think it has really put a whole new aspect to it because previously I think, you know, you'd hear that big pharma kind of paid shill accusations directed at doctors but I think that was not a, a kind of widespread belief. You know, mm. I think, um, I think, it, I think if we if we say just in terms of numbers of people who feel that way, I think in that case probably it has increased. I think I think you'll see it's more mainstream now to have a, a distrust of the medical profession, and I think probably that's a, a long way, a long winded way of what I was trying to get to. I, I think I think that I think trust has been eroded. Hey, I hope you're enjoying my chat with Rohan. If you are, and you want to check out further episodes of Induction, then I'm very pleased to tell you that the next episode is available to watch already over on my streaming service, Nebula. In fact, every single episode of Induction comes out on Nebula a full two weeks before it's available anywhere else. Perhaps you've heard a little bit about Nebula already. It's a premium streaming service created by a bunch of the internet's finest creators, including League Legal, Not Just Bikes, Foreign Man in a Foreign Land, and also me. Our goal is to create a platform where we can create bigger, bolder videos than we're able to make for YouTube. For example, I recently released my brand new Nebula class, How to Research Like a PhD Student. Across 16 lessons, I lift the lid on the research process that informs my videos. I look at how to find reliable sources, how to efficiently read books and journal articles, and how to take notes which will be useful for years to come. If you'd like to check out my new Nebula class, along with a whole host of other premium exclusive content from all your favourite creators, then I'd love it if you'd consider doing so by using our special link go.nebula.tv forward slash induction. Using that link will bag you 40% off an annual subscription to Nebula. That brings it in at just $2.50 a month. That link again is go.nebula.tv forward slash induction. Now, back to my chat with Rohan. I, want, I, wonder if, I wonder if there is a sense to which that connects to other forms of distrust in society. I think you were talking there about the idea of doctors being in ivory towers and that they're an elite that is uh, pushing something 
upon upon you um which isn't to discount that some people have genuine bad experiences of oh absolutely yeah. but but that connects that to the brexit to the donald trump's to the even you know re- reactions to uh, 2008 is a very long time ago now but but those same kinds of or maybe something is up here and a sort of that lack of distrust which i think is it kind of sits across the political spectrum although we often sort of see it as a very uh, right-wing phenomenon because because it's often the figureheads from that side of things that have become to get the most attention in the media i guess um but it's interesting actually to yeah to think about how that connects um that it's not just within medicine that that potentially there is links there um with other aspects of our lives in which people have started to feel like they can put less trust in authority and i think we often mm. we 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 sometimes have a tendency to exceptionalize the present because i think i've definitely seen arguments that have said the same after you know the same in america after watergate or something which is now many many years ago um so i think there's there's always been a trend of uh lack of trust in authority and there's always been you know i guess it, it goes up and down over time but it definitely feels in the kind of post 2016 era i guess that that's been a more present force um i think what you were saying there about the the shift in type as much of as the shifting quantity particularly what you were saying about the ways in which the, there's often a pseudo scientific element to some of these some of these movements that are questioning conventional medicine uh now uh, and the ways in which that ties into that 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 sense of the gendered aspect to it as well because because i often mm. think that i often get missed by a lot of medicine related stuff online because i think it does tend to this this is to a sort of uh stereotype a little bit i guess but it tends to either be targeted uh into an, a, a very feminine end of the, the gender spectrum or a sort of hyper masculine end of the uh gender spectrum where it is all about it's the liver king and it's who I, I don't know a huge amount does he eat the livers he does he eats the livers i, don't I mean he, he he eats twelve thousand dollars worth of steroids in those livers <laughs> per month um yeah. a, as well so the liver i don't think i think the liver is doing a lot of uh heavy lifting um but I, I think it's the steroids really um yes so he eats livers because the, that end and yeah it tends to split and i think I, I i tend to sort of fall between the middle of those maybe um but which is but but there is this element of people who are making some of those outlandish claims will now reference academic papers that they've found is that mm. is that something that is is maybe slightly different um yeah i mean i think um so going back to your first point about sort of the anti um elite sort mm. of um you know anti expertise um i mean what should we call it sort of uh this 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 mentality of of not trusting experts um it's the as Mike, you said the michael gove quote isn't it from the brexit mm. where people in this country have had enough of experts exactly yeah and i think that really you know certainly galvanized a lot of people to 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 see this this as a as a big problem um but as you correctly said you know it's not a new thing and there's historical documentation of the same kind of thing going back into the times of the, of the classics but um uh it clearly seems to be driving much more of the national conversation b- due to social media and mm-hmm. certainly all, all the the other things you mentioned you know I, I would wrap them all up in the same kind of phenomenon of this this mistrust of experts but um coming to the sort of how um uh, that maybe has affected the way people are talking about. So w- when you mentioned pseudoscience, I think just to explain what that means is um, because sometimes I think it can be just used as a catch all term, mm. whereas it has a specific kind of meaning and you can have things that are non-scientific 
mm-hmm. or unscientific, like the crystals or whatever, you know, and, um, you know, s- sort of uh, tarot cards or something like that. Nobody's claiming that scientific. Mm. But the pseudoscience, and this tends to be, or sometimes, uh, you know, um, there's a term bro science, which gives you an I- indication of who th- is kind of more susceptible to this kind of stuff. Um, whereas, you know, women may be uh, more interested in what Gwyneth Paltrow is saying. Um, the male equivalent of Gwyneth Paltrow, for all intents and purposes, is Joe Rogan. And mm-hmm. and at the, it's the exact same kinds of things that they both talk about, but it's portrayed in a different way. And the pseudoscience um, that I'm referring to there is where it sounds scientific. And a lot of the big influencers, the biggest health podcasters in the world, um, who have millions and millions of people listening, that people think they're legitimate scientists and they know what they're talking about when it comes to, uh, I mean, I'm sure they're legitimate scientists in their field, but uh, when it comes to things that they're not experienced with, like the pandemic, like vaccines, like pharmaceuticals, or any, if, even if you take all the uh, controversial kind of topics out of the equation and something more like exercise or, you know, um, diet, obviously that's a, that's a big one I haven't mentioned so far. That's, that's, that's the, you know, ground zero for this, this kind of stuff is nutrition and diet. Um, and they'll talk with these scientific sounding words, you know, they'll talk about cell pathways and molecular signaling and enzymes and upregulation and hormones. And to a a general audience, they sound like they really know what they're talking about. And, and it, and it really gives the impression that this is something. And as you say, they cite sources, but one of the big messages that I um, say in my videos is, I don't know, uh, let's say 80%, maybe even more of medical of, of um, journal published articles. So these are not, I'm not talking about preprints. I'm talking about in actual journals is absolute garbage. It is not worth the pixels on your screen. It is horseshit. And honestly, uh, you know, if you dig into these sources, they're like, Oh, this, this guy's really legitimate. Like he's citing his sources. You go and look at those sources and they're from the most, what we refer to as predatory journals or just complete rubbish journals. And you can publish anything. And, you know, COVID is a classic example. There have been over 200,000 articles published about COVID in the scientific press. And I mean, I would say 2% of those are worth reading. The rest mm. is just rubbish, and it's it's the, this is a whole big top conversation about you know all the problems with academia. But just because something is published in a journal, that does not mean it's good. You still need to have that ability to look at a paper and say, is this a good research project? Is this you know something that is is worth paying attention to? Is it reliable? Is it reproducible? So these are all the skills that you can't get by just reading the abstract on PubMed and going, oh yeah, this you know eight out of 10 mice um, had some results. So now I'm going to go and talk about it on my podcast. Um, And uh, this is, I think there's been a massive explosion in this kind of bro science, pseudoscience, um, which takes in a lot of people. It's really convincing. And I've had friends who are medics and scientists asking me, you know, is this guy legit? And I'm like, what are you talking about? You you (laughs) just go and look at the stuff he's saying. Um, So uh, yeah, this is, like I find a real frustrating issue. I found so I was recently making a class for Nebula, the streaming platform that we both have stuff on, and uh, was obviously I'm looking at humanity, social science based stuff. But was uh, but the class is all about research skills, and one of the uh, lessons within that was about how to kind of suss out a good source, I guess, and how to you know think contextually about the book or web page that is in front of you and go, okay, is this something that the information I'm going to take from uh, is going to be legitimate in some way? Um, And yeah, throughout that was really, trying to write that lesson was really difficult because at the end of the day, you you can't really know until you have done that hard work of actually going through something and comparing it to other uh to other sources on the same topic um 
which I suppose is a little bit different. You know, we're different in the kinds of uh, sources I'm engaging with most of the time, but you have to balance that looking for those signs that maybe something, you know, if, if a book has been published by a university press, sometimes that means it's a little bit more legit than if it's been published by, than if it's a sort of mass market, something from uh, a kind of more mainstream publisher, but, but not all always. And so all those kind of, uh, signs that you look for aren't actually uh, perfect in any way. No, um, I, I mean, you know, even if you discounted all the journals with an impact factor less than a certain number or something, saying, yeah, I'm only going to go for the top journals, even then, there have been catastrophically bad papers published in the main, main medical journals. I mean, the MMR autism infamous paper from Andrew Wakefield um, was in the Lancet. You know that is the oldest and one of the most respected medical journals in the in the world. And um, it took thirteen years for that to be retracted. So, you know that there is no substitute, unfortunately, for having expertise in a particular field so you understand the relevant issues. If I read some of the papers you're talking about, I, I wouldn't have a clue. I, I'd have no framework to to say you know, to any red flag, you might read that and go, hang on, this is completely incongruous with, with other, other things. I, I, I wouldn't know. So, you know, this is why I, I think, unfortunately, that the, the, the anti-expertise um, uh, kind of mindset and, and do your own research, um, you'll always come unstuck. And that isn't to say you should have blind trust. And, you know, one of the messages that I, I always try and promulgate is, um, not to have blind trust in the medical profession. And I talk about the, the mistakes that med medicine has made uh, over the years and their myriad. But um, there is, uh, you know, and so it is challenging. You know, people ask me, how do I, how do I know what is good medical advice? And there are some kind of general rules, but it is really, really tough. And, and there is, just no easy way of saying that unfortunately you are likely to get fooled we all do we all will will fall for um uh, things that are not true if it just happens to be in the particular bias that we're susceptible to and i'm including everybody in that so it's tough yeah i think it's interesting um that that, that thing we keep coming back to about the uh, distrust of, uh, of of elites and experts and yet a lot of the uh, people that are most enthusiastic about that distrust are also trying to sort of ape the language of of that cadre of experts i guess in the kind of the idea of doing your own research and uh waving of studies that, that they've managed to find um and the kind of appeals to authority there's there's often mm, a totally if if someone i disagree with is a doctor then uh you know if i if i disagree with you then it's because you are in cahoots with big pharma and it's because you're a you're a interventional cardiologist uh whereas if someone i agree with whether if, if i agree with you then i go oh well this is rohan francis he's a he's a um <laughs> interventional cardiologist don't you know and <laughs> and 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 using that kind the, the same language yeah uh, uh because it is really easy to get i i think i was watching uh your not your last video but the one previously where you were talking about a lot of these topics and I had, um, you mentioned diet a moment ago. I had a really uh, similar experience with doing intermittent fasting a bunch of uh, maybe a year or so ago. Maybe, maybe I think maybe time has passed more than that, but um, uh, where I think I downloaded an app. I'd sort of decided that for, uh, you know, entirely uh, not personal thing. I was like, oh, I, I I would like to be a little bit slimmer than I currently am. Um, and I down and I decided I was going to give this a try and downloaded an app that was essentially a timer that would that I'd go. Oh my, I think it was eight hours. I think now my eight hours of eating is going to begin, and now it's going to stop for a while, and I'm I'm not going to eat for a bit. And but it would give me all this kind of scientific language mm, about yeah, totally. After six hours, my body is doing this. After 12 hours my body is doing this after 14 that it was doing different kinds of uh 
that it was burning different kinds of energy at different times, which I imagine there's maybe something to. Like I know, like I f- from my running, I know that after a while you start burning fat because you've run out of carbohydrates. That's the limits of my bi- biology knowledge. But um, but there was all this kind of language by, and I think as you were saying in your video, actually, the reason that, and I. I'm not making a claim for it to work for anyone other than myself. I found it quite useful was that it was a really w- easy way of eating slightly less because I didn't, exactly, yeah. didn't have chocolate in the evening because I was like, oh, it's nine o'clock. So I've got to clock off the eating schedule <laughs> right now. It meant I didn't have a big breakfast in the morning and it meant that therefore my caloric intake was was lower than uh, it had been previously. So there's all this scientific stuff around it, whether, whereas actually the reason it was working was because I'm someone who doesn't want to have to read the backs of all the boxes and do all the calculations of calories and macros and whatever. I just want to have a really simple uh, kind of simpletons thing where it's d- don't eat now, do, do, do it now. And therefore it worked as a really easy thing for me. Um, but there was all this scientific around it, which I could just see it was really easy to get drawn into and to go, mm. oh, well, if I do two more hours one day, then it's going to, th- that's going to be when it's really going to, you know, if I do, if rather than 16, I do 18 hours, that's going to suddenly make all the difference compared to the, because the kinds of things that are happening in my body are going to be radically different. Um, and I don't know if there's any truth to that at all. Maybe, maybe there's something. Well, I mean, I, th- I think you've described it perfectly there. You've kind of summarized the whole thing. And, and intermi- intermittent fasting is a classic sort of example of, of this. Um, and, you know, cards on the table. I, I've I've done, you know, I, I like to experiment with these things myself. And um, I did an even more extreme version. I only ate in a two-hour window oh, wow. for a long time, you know, uh, a couple of years. And... Um, uh, uh, you've exactly correct you know it, it what it just does is it makes a nice simple way to reduce your caloric intake but there's all this uh, uh, uh the, you know f- fasting certainly does offer some additional health benefits beyond just re- reducing how much you eat but not fasting 16 hours a day mm. i mean that that the evidence for that kind of stuff comes from prolonged fasting and from long term kinds of um, caloric restriction, which is shown particularly in sort of mouse models to have longevity benefits and things like that. And there are certain um, processes that happen in the cell that that uh, can can uh, be observed, but not in the kind of fasting that you or I are doing on a kind of daily basis with an app. That's you're just kind of extrapolating from something else entirely, and you're seeing a benefit, but not for the reason you think, you know, it's not none of the, you're not activating some magical pathway by just skipping breakfast, because that's essentially what this is, is just you're skipping breakfast, yeah. you know? <laughs> so, um, so uh, this is, that's a classic example, you know, that that's a, it's a very uh, a good demonstration, but it exists in many things, you know, talking about breakfast, like all for years, we, we had this understanding that breakfast is this vital meal and it changes your metabolic rate. And if you don't eat breakfast, then blah, blah, blah. And then it's like, actually, you know, maybe don't eat breakfast and then it's fine. And so we, we make all these, you know, we're very seduced by these scientific mechanisms. And as you said, you know, often these people will criticize ac- accepted mainstream science for the podcast listeners. I'm doing the air quotes there. Um, and uh, uh, they will, but they will still wear the clothes of science. They, they, I sometimes call it science cosplay. You know, they, yeah. they want to sound sciencey. And so they still talk in the same kind of language, but, um, you know, they're, they're, they're positioning themselves as someone who's not willing to accept just the, 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 the science that everybody else believes. You know, I've found this, this special thing out myself and I'm, I'm communicating it to you. Yeah, because I've, I've seen it even in not something I've particularly taken a big look at, but I, I, I was a, a member of uh, Next Door for about a week. And uh, there was, oh, a, yes, I... there was, we went, uh, as, you, you were talking par- about it. <laughs> apparently it was a formative experience in my life that I'm going to talk about nonstop on this podcast. But w- one thing on that was that everyone up on my street got really up in arms that there might be a 5G um, mast near us. And I think realistically what happened 
is people didn't want the mast and therefore did a load of sciencey stuff to be able to justify yeah. rather than just going I don't it doesn't look good and I don't want it uh, they, they sort of wanted to be able to justify it in five or six different different ways and even that the language of science was in there or, or attempts to mm. imitate the language of science were in there um and I think I I, I see it in lots of different aspects of kind of the public sphere I guess wherein I think we've we've recognized sort of the need for critical thinking and lots of people have realized that that is something you should do but we've not necessarily got good at how to do it almost mm. that there is that in the do your own research uh th yes that's a really good generally that is a, a very good uh instinct to have is to a claim is put to you you want to go away and check whether that is substantiated and whether that is, uh, you know, if it's something about the way you're going to change your life and your health in particular, that that is something that you want to go and go, yeah, I will. Mm. Um, which is, you know, when we are engaging with conventional medicine, often, you know, you come away with a pamphlet of some description, don't you, which explains exactly what uh, is going to happen in a particular procedure or a, a link to, to a website or a, a, a support group to to find out a little bit more about it um and what the you know what the risks are and what the benefits are and uh, and all that um but but the yeah the, the the instinct to do your own research is a really really good one but that maybe we've not developed the i say we that's really broad isn't it but 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 there's, there's sometimes the instinct to do that without having the, the skills to be able to do that really well yeah. And I mean, I, I think I would say it is impossible. You know, mm. I, I, you, you cannot be an expert in everything. You, there's there's no way that me doing my own research about climate change mm. is going to be uh, based in any kind of, you know, knowledge of the field. I, mm. I, I am simply not equipped to do that. And so, you know, I. I as you say, it's a great instinct to have, but you also have to understand that it's it's impossible. So if you try and verify every single thing, then you won't be able to function. But of course, nobody verifies every single thing. Nobody, um, you know, uh, questions the pilots or the engineers that have built a plane when they're going on holiday. They just get on the plane. They trust the experts when it comes to that. They trust the experts who make their cars. They're not checking their sums. But there are certain topics where, you know, there is a some flashpoint and there's a bit of group think and that people say, actually, on this particular topic, I am going to question the experts and I am going to, you know, find out stuff that they don't know. Now, I'm not at all suggesting that there aren't bad experiences and mistakes made by uh, the medical profession. and. I think that is one of the main drivers for, you know, why people look for, for alternatives. Um, but perhaps maybe pre-pandemic, it was on an individual basis. You know, somebody has a bad experience um, with a with with medical profession and then they are turned off. Or, um, you know, sometimes that is a failing, as in a, a sort of negligent, kind of failing from the medical profession um but sometimes it is just the limits of what we can offer you know unfortunately mm -hmm. there are a lot of diseases and disease processes that we we are just not very good at treating um from very severe stuff where people turn in desperation with a metastatic cancer to um an alternative medicine practitioner and you know who would blame them for doing that but also for things that are very common back pain you know um is just we're not very good at it we're just not uh, you know i would not recommend a doctor as the person to to help with chronic back pain most of the time that is the kind of pl uh, problem where seeking an alternative is you know uh, probably a a good starting point um and uh, you know you were saying about the 5g um and people sort of looking for scientific 
language to justify something actually that's more of a visceral emotional reaction mm -hmm. and i kind of want us to be a bit more willing to just say i don't like this or i do like this you know you don't have to say that the the reason i enjoy having a, a massage is because it's activating some um you know pathway and it's uh, changing the dopamine levels and do a little infographic with serotonin and dopamine and i have to look at the sun and do an ice bath and stand on one foot and you know you just it's fine to say it's just nice i like doing these things they feel nice mm. what's wrong with that why do we have to frame everything through this scientific paradigm that's that's no way to live life you know like even as someone who's trained in science, there's a part of me that is that more kind of irrational, emotional side. And if I like something, I like it. I don't have to dress it up in this, this kind of clothing of science. And if I don't like something, um, you know, say, I think a lot of this, say behind, behind the, uh, the vaccine kind of, um, people who are reluctant to, to take the vaccine and, you know, being reluctant to have a vaccine is fine. That's a, perfectly natural human reaction um but then i think perhaps you know because there is a lot of polarization they feel like just saying ah you know i don't want to i don't want to take it and then you know people will accuse them of saying oh this is very mm -hmm. selfish you're a horrible person they'll go on the defensive and then they'll start looking for supporting evidence and you know there are um uh, of course complications from any medical intervention but people will start, you know, focusing on very rare complications and, and talking about that rather than just admitting, saying, look, I'm just mm. not keen on having needles stuck in my arm. And, um, you know, it, it seems to be this is more just more. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Sort of it, it's, it's harder to question when you're you're bringing this kind of scientific aspect into it. Mm. I wanted to, but before we run out of time, I did want to talk a little bit about something you're you're getting to there as well, because I think one of the brilliant things about the way you, that you approach many of these topics is that you do take this really generous approach to stuff. I think, um, you know, like I, 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 most of the stuff I had read or seen about Wim Hof before watching your video was just, haha, look at this silly man who jumps in holes in icy places. Uh, and and you you sort of had this much more okay well it's sort of it's impressive what he does and also here's what we can learn from from what he does and here's what here's what people are getting out of engaging with this idea and here's how for some people copying some of these techniques might work um and i think you you said something in a recent video about and i think maybe you said this a couple of times about the sort of magic of placebos and sort of talking about actually that's a really interesting phenomenon that when we want something to work sometimes it it does and we can sort of laugh at that as a, as a sort of weird thing but actually it's a really interesting uh phenomenon sometimes um and particularly you were talking about uh kind of alternative therapies recently of just the the, the connection and care that can happen in that moment of you know, maybe it is a massage that when you go in and, you know, if you've booked a massage, it's maybe half an hour and you get someone who is going to say, hi, how are you? How is your day going? Would you like to take a take a seat? Would you like to uh, sit down and then spend time massaging you and going, oh, is this the spot that was? And you go, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, in a way that I don't think we get elsewhere in society huge without without trying to do some sort of uh the, the sky is falling cultural decline thing um you know we, we don't get a huge amount because we live in quite efficient times i would say um i think there, there was something brilliant you're talking about the way in which that connection can be it fulfills a need that maybe we don't get elsewhere oh 100 percent, and um uh, you know i think uh, well First of all, with regard to placebo, perfect timing because I'm hopefully a week or two away from an hour long video all about the placebo effect. It's uh, I'm sort of editing it now. So depending on when this comes out, um, then I, I, I'm going to go into to more depth there. And you're quite right that 
you know, I, some, sometimes I, I um, don't like a lot of the science communication out there, which is very kind of like, you know, it's kind of laughing at, at people and saying, ha ha, how stupid they are to believe this. And, you know, it's just a placebo. Oh, you're so dumb, you know? And I was like, that's kind of missing the point. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, if somebody, um, say Reiki, right? Reiki is a, um, a pseudoscientific belief where there, there's energy flowing through the body and by placing hands or sometimes not even actually touching the body, but often they'll, they'll sort of make light contact with the body. You can channel energy and, um, you know, it's got a sort of origin in Eastern philosophy, a sort of chi mm. and, and flow, flow of energy and things like that. And if somebody is, you know, um, uh, having chemotherapy, and chemotherapy is horrible. I mean, it makes you feel like real garbage. And they, uh, most of um, my audience, probably yours are similar, are, are going to be in the US or the UK. And both of these countries have healthcare systems, which, you know, you don't have to, to look hard to find problems with. In the UK, the average GP um, appointment. I mean, the set time for a GP appointment, family doctor appointment, is ten minutes, and that in, that includes not just the consultation, examination, and advice, but also the doctor has to do all their admin and paperwork all in that ten minute slot. So it can feel incredibly rushed and you know cold and and not caring. In the US, obviously, it's it's a very different kind of system. It's very much driven by money. There's huge disparity in the kind of healthcare you can access and um, one of the main complaints is that the doctor's looking at the electronic health record the whole time and having to put in so many tick boxes and mm -hmm. fill in different things because it's all governed by coding so for billing. So they have to mm -hmm. click something like 80 times in a typical consultation. And the patient feels like, hang on, you're not even looking at me. You know, there's no human connection here. So imagine coming, you know, that's your experience of the the medical profession, This this kind of cold interaction and it's not because the people are cold it's because they just don't have the time they, they just can't take that time to 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 sit with a patient hold a hand listen to, listen to them you know i think every healthcare professional would love to do that but mm -hmm. the pressures are just sort of too extreme um and so say they're suffering from horrible nausea from their chemotherapy and they go to their doctor and say what what can I do? And they go, oh, well, here's an anti-emetic tablet and they're not very effective. And then they, they say, their friend says, well, you know, why don't you try Reiki? It helped me. And they go there and they're in a calm environment. They're obviously paying. So, you know, I'm not comparing uh, like for like here because they're going to be paying out of pocket. This is not going to mm. be provided by any sort of government health uh, service, but the practitioner will take maybe half an hour, one hour with them, listen to their concerns. And there's that kind of human connection, mm -hmm. which is missing from a lot of the way healthcare is delivered. Um, and so they may say, I feel a bit better, you know, afterwards, that nausea, then the cancer is not going to be any different. And, and, you know, if they believe they're curing their cancer, that's where it becomes problematic. And that's where you'd have to strongly try and explain to them saying, look, you, you, you must carry on having your chemotherapy because that's proven with evidence whereas Reiki isn't. But if their nausea gets better, something subjective, they just feel a bit better, these what we call kind of, you know, quality of life endpoints, then to shout at them saying, ah, it's just a placebo, it's like, that, that's really mm. not fair because that person has derived a benefit. That mm. benefit is real. The only um, thing is they have created that improvement themselves through the, the sort of um, catalyst being the, the Reiki practitioner or whatever. And I find that fascinating so that, mm. that this placebo effect is something that we can access ourselves and everybody has their different kind of way of doing that. For the kind of bro science um, market, it may be Wim Hof taking an ice bath and, you know, like taking on the world and ah, liver king kind of macho thing. But for somebody with chemotherapy, it might be something much calmer, Reiki, something like that, chiropractic. Um, 
so I, 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 you know, I try and actually use the placebo effects in my own practice, even though I'm using evidence-based medicine, mm. you can still maximize the placebo effect on top. And this is where there's a really ethical sort of quandary because I can't lie to a patient that is fundamentally against the duties of a doctor in you know every country. And I can't guarantee that something's going to work. But an alternative medicine practitioner can say this, you know, green juice is going to work. It's fantastic. It's the best thing. It, doctors hate hate me for saying this. And, you know, this is that one weird trick that mm. is going to fix your belly fat or whatever it is. Um, I can't say that. But ironically, that person might derive a bigger placebo effect from the alternative medicine practitioner saying that because their expectation might yeah. be greater. So this is, it's not a level playing field, is it? You know, we, we have to be constrained by, by science, but I try and kind of push the envelope as much as I can. So, you know, I won't guarantee something, but I'll, I'll say, I'm really confident, you know, this is, this is, you're gonna, you're gonna feel a lot better. And even for, you know, operations, I will take the time to show the patient their coronary artery on the screen afterwards. And I say, look at it beforehand. Oh, it was so narrow. And, you know, now, wow, it's like a eight lane motorway wide open. There's just blood getting to your heart much better now. Why not, you know, give them any chance I can to try and get a bit of extra benefit. Um, I can't, you know, the placebo effect is, is additional. Mm. If the, if the therapy is ineffective, completely inert, I mean, that's what a placebo is. It's, it's, it's an inert thing then all you're going to get from it is the placebo. Whereas if I can give a active therapy, like a, a medication or a, a stent or something like that, then there's a, a real effect, but then there's also a placebo still on top of that as well. Mm. So there are some fascinating trials that have looked into this where they have given morphine to patients who are you know, in, in pain post-operative or something. Um, and they have uh, told them they're giving morphine. Um, and they have a really good effect. But then they have still given the same morphine um, uh, to, uh, to other people in the trial, but they haven't told them. Mm. And their pain the pain um, response was was much, I mean, they had much more pain. They had a, some improvement, but uh, they, until the, the and, and then they, there's an interesting spin on this, like they had the nurse come in and inject it and make a whole kind of, um, mm. sort of procedure yeah. and make a, a ritual out of it. And that got the most benefit. Whereas when it was kind of, uh, they were unaware, they, they derived a much smaller benefit. I guess maybe it's a similar thing to you showing the, the artery pre and post where you've got a expectation that something is going to happen and, um, and you're, you're prepared for a change in some way, maybe that, that knowing that, you know, we are all vaguely aware of what morphine is, I guess. So you sort of maybe are prepared for that change um, in a slightly different way, maybe. But maybe part of it's the sort of I think that I think I feel like the bro science version of the Reiki feels like the cold showers. That's the mm. I, I had a friend who got into cold showers where there's probably some long kind of scientific sounding explanation for why having a cold shower in the morning gets you up ready for the day but in actual fact how much of it is that you're just leaping into a cold shower and that's making you go oh, and sort of blowing the cobwebs off a bit i guess um yeah but but again that the, you know if there's something in that that works and it's not actively harmful in in a different way and you're not you know not doing something else like you were saying that that yeah there is something fascinating about about that so the the joke i sometimes make is coffee right so mm. You know, coffee is one of those things that is in the press every day, ca either causing disease or preventing disease. Mm. Berries, tea, coffee, chocolate, wine. These are the things that just, you know, they won't go away. There's always some joker trying to, you know, do a research project on these. I don't know why. But then I realized, ah, this is, I, I, now I understand why these, these studies exist. I drink a cup of coffee every morning. So I might as well just believe it's doing something extra anyway, right? Because I know that coffee's, you know, these these kind of substances which have such a tiny effect one way or the other, it doesn't matter. I don't 
I don't care. But I might as well just so I'll just pick out the studies that say coffee makes you live longer and coffee makes your hair shiny and everything. And I'll say, right, I'm going to believe that because I'm drinking the coffee anyway. So yeah. let, I might as well derive the, the placebo effect benefit as well. I mean, it's, and, it's the 5G mask that you don't want there. But also there's a scientific reason you don't you're just sort of latching the stuff onto it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. So uh, we're always looking for this kind of, you know, justification for our instincts. Um when sometimes I just, you know, I don't think we need to. We can just be honest and say, hey, I like this. Feel makes me feel good. I'm going to do it. Mm. Well, what a, what, a, what a nice moment to, to wrap up on. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for giving up some of your, what looks like a very sunny evening. I've got my curtains closed, so I've got no idea. But, um, but what looks like a nice sunny evening. Thank you for giving up some of that to, to, to talk to me and to everyone who is listening and, and watching. We, this is the first one we've recorded since we released some into the world. So I can now say with some certainty that some people are watching. Uh, so yeah, no, I, I watched I watched both. So, yeah, great. Thank you so much for that. If people who haven't previously watched or listened to your stuff, because I know you've also been putting stuff out in podcast form recently as well. Uh, if people haven't seen your stuff before, how can they how can they find you? I'm Medlife Crisis on in all the usual all the usual places all the all the places well thank you so much and and yeah have have a good rest of your evening you too tom L lovely to talk to you thank you so much for listening to my chat with rohin i hope you enjoyed it as i mentioned during the show if you want to get early access to new episodes of induction and also check out my new nebula class how to research like a phd student then you can find out more about how to do so by heading to go.nebula.tv forward slash induction Signing up to Nebula using our links and watching or listening to episodes of the show over on Nebula also really helps to support us to continue making more episodes of the show. So that link again is go.nebula.tv forward slash induction. Thank you once again for listening or watching and I'll see you in the next episode of the show.